Um, I'm fortunate I don't have any fancy graphics. It's just a lot of uh, talking by me, a few questions on the, uh, on the screen to uh, make people think uh, and understand what they know about football, but also Asian professional club football. Uh, so very quickly, this is me. Um, so I was ex-AFC, I was there for five and a half years, uh, managed the sports legal department where we had uh, eight staff and we covered all the sports law, regulatory, corporate governance uh, issues in Asian football. After that, I've started my own business now. We have an office in uh, Kuala Lumpur and an office in Adelaide in Australia. And up there you can see some of the appointments that I currently have uh, leading in. World Badminton, Australian Olympic Committee, uh, Football Association of Malaysia, eSports, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I should also say uh, I'm a graduate of the FIFA Master Program and um, I'll give a shout to the, the president, uh, sorry, the general secretary of the CIS who's come here to, uh, to uh, give me uh, his best wishes. But for those that were looking into an international sports master's program, I would highly recommend you go visit the CIS booth, which is just outside an expo area. So very quickly, before we start uh, talking about Asian club football, I'll talk about global football uh, in a nutshell. So for those that are in around the industry, you would understand uh, what we have here. It's basically the sports pyramid, the football pyramid, which we look at for football. However, you take FIFA away from the top and you insert FIBA, FIVB, IAAF, etc. They effectively all look basically the same um, with their own peculiarities per sport. But essentially, this model, the pyramid model, which is uh, effectively a, a European model of sport, have an international federation at the top of the pyramid. And the membership of that international federation is made up of the national associations, so here called the football associations. And in football, we have also the regional associations, which are called confederations. They're not members of FIFA, but they're recognized by and they follow the rules of FIFA. And the football associations are also members of those confederations. And at the bottom of the pyramid is the reason we actually attend and watch football and the reason why this summit exists. All the stakeholders, all those actors that are involved in, in the game that we love and we follow. And those are clubs, state federations, regional associations, players associations, coaches, referee associations. Some countries might have different futsal associations or women's football associations, etc. Now, depending on the governance structure of football in that country, these stakeholder groups may or may not be a member of their national football association. And of course, that then impacts upon the amount of say that they have in how football is run and governed in, in their country. And one, one that is always missing from this slide whenever I talk about it, which I remind myself every year to put up, which I forget, is of course leagues. I should mention that given La Liga's involvement here. But leagues are another, uh, another stakeholder in the governance structure. This is how football is generally organized globally. Credit to Wikipedia for the image, thank you. Um, so you can see here the six confederations of, uh, uh, which uh, provide the uh, Council of FIFA and provide for the confederation tournaments. You'll notice some basic they're basically aligned based on geography. You'll notice some anomalies, of course. You'll see in the South American continent uh, three, three pink members who are actually form part of CONCACAF, even though they're on the continent of South America. Australia, obviously, is part of the AFC. You see Israel just down on the edge of the Asian continent is actually included in UEFA. Kazakhstan and Russia in the middle, mostly in Asia, geographically, but in UEFA for football, etc. And if we talk about Asia, we break it down again into five separate what we call zones. And these form part of the uh, AFC statutes. So you have Southeast Asia and Australia, which is the Southeast Asian Football Association. East Asia, which is China, Japan, Korea, and the other countries in green. The subcontinent, South Asian Football Federation, dominated by India. Yellow countries are the Central Asian Football Association. So that would be Iran, plus the ex-Soviet Republic, such as uh, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, etc. And then in West Asia in the red, we see the Gulf and the various Arabic speaking countries. So in total there, we've got 47 member associations in Asian football. And when we talk about professional club football in Asia, you can already imagine looking at that slide, uh, the number of issues that, that arise, let alone uh, the differences across that region. So just to, give you, just to give you an example of what you're looking at right there, and I'll come quickly to my notes because I forgot this part. But here you're looking at two-thirds of the world's population, 11 different time zones, over 30 different national languages and hundreds of other unofficial languages. You're looking at at least four sanctioned countries by the UN, 
which makes transferring prize money for World Cup qualifiers a lot of fun for FIFA and AFC, as you can imagine. Major conflict areas. I mean, on the screen in front of you, you see already uh, or the, the biggest flashpoint currently in the world, you would say, is, is in Hong Kong, even though it's not in conflict. But you've got Hong Kong and China, you've got Taiwan and China, you've got the Korean Peninsula. You go down, you have issues in Myanmar, you have issues with the, the pirates coming off the Philippines. You go across and then you've got Kashmir, of course, in the blue. Um, you've got all the issues on the Chinese border with the blue countries. You go into um, gold, you can see Iran there. Obviously, Iran's been in the news for the last two weeks for some very uh, interesting issues with its neighbours over in the red. And in the bottom there, you've got Yemen. You go up and then you've got the east side of Saudi, which just had the drone attack. You've got the little dot there you can see, which is Qatar, which has a number of issues with all of its neighbours at the moment. And then, of course, you go further up right to the border and then you get to Palestine. So in terms of organising football, club football, national team football, whatever it might be, you have a lot of off-field challenges, which at the end of the day, when it's 11 versus 11, 5 versus 5, um, shouldn't matter, but absolutely do matter. Aside from, aside from the geopolitical issues, of course, you have a, a wide disparity of money, a wide disparity in living conditions, a wide disparity in uh, cultural issues. You've got G8 countries, G20 countries, and you've also got countries which live on, uh, where the population lives on less than one or two dollars a day. Uh, you've got the birthplace of all major global religions is somewhere on this screen right here. And you've got countries which are mono-ethnic, countries which are multi-ethnic, countries made up of mo more than a dozen uh, different ethnic groups either living in, in harmony or peace internally. So amongst all of this, we organise football in Asia. And we organise club football and we organise professional football. Um, and we organise national team football. So when we look at who organises football in Asia, we have to go back to that global model again. I apologise for the slides, you didn't realise the projector was so big. But this is the basic model, this is the basic model of how international football is organised from a regulatory perspective. So who organises what in international football? So when you first look at, on the left, you've got FIFA, International Federation. FIFA manages matters which are exclusively in the remit of the International Federation. These are matters which need to be regulated universally, internationally and consistently across all jurisdictions. Things like the match calendar, player status, national eligibility, player agents, laws of the game, etc. You can imagine if laws of the game was taken away from FIFA and made the remit of the national associations, you would have 211 FIFA associations and 100 different types of football being played globally, each with their own different rules. These guys prefer kick-ins instead of throw-ins. These guys get rid of handball. These guys hate offside. These guys play with no goalkeeper, etc., etc. On the other side, the confederations themselves. The confederations just manage two particular uh, peculiarities uh, on their own, which you can see up the front, coaching education and club licensing. FIFA does uh, engage in these areas, but the primary authority is left to the confederations themselves to manage their own programs. Coaching education and club licensing, both originally uh, being regulatory issues which were dealt with by UEFA and then rolling out to the other confeds. And in the middle, you can see what FIFA and the confederations both do. So you roll down and that looks pretty obvious. Competitions, development, elections, disciplinary issues, anti-doping, etc. And they all overlap. That's why you have a match calendar and that's why they sync their regulations together. Now, of course, all of these things here are, are fine at an international level, but at a national level, you know, for example, we're sitting here in Spain, a country which is governed by the Royal Spanish Football Federation. They do all of this at national level. So you really have three different competing levels within international sport, and particularly within international football, of authority. And who has authority at a certain time really depends on what competition uh, an issue is taking part in, or what competition a club is playing in, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So now, that's a really basic introduction to football governance. That lecture normally takes four hours, and you got it in about six minutes. So um, if you have any questions, by all means, let me know. I'm sure you don't. It puts everyone to sleep, so it's fine. Um, so we'll move on quickly, and I've only got a couple of slides on the uh, about the challenges of professional Asian club football. I'll talk about them very briefly. Um, but these slides come from. These slides come from the experience of the last seven years of working in, in professional club football in Asia. I've identified, after speaking with a number of my clients this week and, and yesterday, 
identified a number of core areas for them which they believe are their main challenges when it comes to being not only a successful football club, but also for a commercially successful football club, both on and off the field. You see, the first, the first one which they all raised to me was uh, this limited understanding of football regulations, the football regulatory framework. So what I spoke about just here, who has authority in what area, how are they meant to respond to this authority, etc., cetera, et cetera. The primary issue for most clubs in this respect in, in the Asian football space is language. So in all of the countries in the AFC, the 47 member associations which uh, come under the banner of AFC, 46 of which come under the FIFA banner, all of them except the Lebanese Football Federation receive their communications from FIFA and AFC in English. FIFA sometimes sends communications to Lebanon in French as well, but otherwise they're all receiving communications in English. Now the main issue there is, is then for many of these countries in that space, there's only eight, eight actual countries within Asia that have English as an official language. For many of these countries, language is their first issue when it comes to dealing internationally, both at a football federation perspective, but a particularly for a club perspective. The reason why that is, is, is quite simple. Contractual issues, contracts number one, foreign players, and foreign players and foreign coaches when they're coming to Asia, unless they're working in a sophisticated economy which already practices a dual contracting system, they will automatically um, request and negotiate their contracts in English language. So for a club, particularly a club playing in a market where English is not a, uh, a widely spoken language, a widely used language, that's one of their first issues. The second one is not understanding how FIFA applies the FIFA regulations on the status and transfer of players, particularly uh, in respect of the various protections that are provided to players. So clubs are now only beginning to understand in Asia after receiving a multitude of decisions from FIFA that their local contractual rules are not applicable when it comes to disputes under uh, the FIFA judicial bodies and the, the FIFA dispute resolution system. So, you know, common examples are uh, clauses in contracts which give clubs a right to terminate for poor performance or for medical reasons, um, or the ability to terminate coaches for poor performance or for not meeting a various technical standard, etc. These are the types of things that FIFA won't accept when decisions come before their judicial bodies. But because these are predominantly in English, these are issues which are not educated to the clubs. So those clubs and those clients that I work with that actually know more about these issues are those, unfortunately, they've been in more disputes. So the more disputes you are, are in, the more they learn about these issues. Um, and the more they understand the need for specialist advice or the need to get an advisor to come in to help them avoid these issues uh, at the start. Um, and the big one is, is that one at the bottom, the lack of education from the governing bodies. So if you're a club in Cambodia or a club in China or a club in Saudi Arabia or Iran, you don't have regular uh, contact with uh, an Asian club association like you have in Europe with the European Club Association. You don't have education sessions coming from AFC. You don't have education sessions targeted coming from FIFA, which explain to you, this is what this means. This is how you should be, this is how you can comply with the regulations. Uh, these are the types of things which will ensure you will receive a club license under club licensing regulation, et cetera, et cetera. So these are the types of things from an international regulatory perspective that clubs have identified as, as having um, their biggest concern when it comes to participating in the global transfer market. And in, in, that, in that framework where people like me come in and which some of you who may be advisors in the market come in, you can see those clubs being taken advantage of. So a uh, common example I give and um, particularly with our Chinese club clients is they don't understand the, the language of the contract necessarily or it's in sophisticated legal or technical language. They can understand, you know, the basic contract, five-year contract, 10 million euros a year, et cetera, et cetera. But then they look into the transfer agreement and there's the little hidden things in there which, uh, which they would never understand and where the European clubs are trying to take advantage of. Numbers are net, not gross. Um, solidarity contributions or training compensation, depending on, uh, on, the, on the transfer, are pushed back onto the club in addition to the transfer fee. Um, medical clauses are removed so the club doesn't have any protection, et cetera, et cetera. So these are the types of things which if there was further education in the market, uh, then you would see not only the big Asian football clubs, but also 
the middle range and lower range in football clubs would keep their disputes out of FIFA and you'd see a, a much fairer, I believe, uh, transfer market for players. Second thing is the big one, and it was a session that happened right before, just here. Limited commercialization. Why do I say that? We saw the five people on, on the stage and they were all great people, but not one of those was a representative of a Chinese club from China, speaking about China, or a CFA. The private companies, Argentinian Football Association, La Liga. Exactly. So it's a question of money in, money out. So what we're finding in many Asian territories right now, particularly with the major sponsor of this conference and other um, big European leagues, are they move into, uh, into the Asian club markets to push their own brands, whether it's La Liga, whether it's the Premier League, Serie A, uh, Bundesliga, etc. And what that does is that takes away from the local game and it provides that automatic competition for your big clubs in a Thailand or a Malaysia or in India or whatever it might be with a product which is, let's admit, far superior both technically and commercially and is much better at producing an image and producing a narrative which uh, fans are going to tap into. So that's the first issue, money out versus money in. When you look, and, and similarly, when you look into the major investors in football, particularly those coming into uh, European football clubs in the big five or outside of the big five leagues now, a lot of that money is actually originating from the AFC territory. You would have seen some news on the weekend recently about uh, Qatar Airways sponsoring a, 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 lower, a lower level club, but in the top division in Belgium, for example. Of course, everyone knows about City Football Group money, which is going, going globally, but concentrated in, uh, in Manchester, et cetera, et cetera. And I don't need to, you are all followers of football. Most of you are European, I'm sure. So you know who's investing in your football. Um, Saudi Arabian Prince, the former chairman of the General Sports Authority, has just bought a club here in, in Spain, Almeria. And another Saudi Arabian prince, the form, another former chairman of the General Sports Authority, has just won a high court battle in the UK over Sheffield United ownership. So these stories are popping up every week. You guys would have read them, you'd have seen them. That's another issue. That money, which could be invested domestically, locally, is in fact being taken out and invested in leagues abroad and overseas for, for various reasons. Infrastructure. So uh, I'm half Italian, don't hold that against me. But uh, I actually paint one of the biggest reasons for Juventus' success over the last seven years in Serie A is because they own their own stadium. They control their commercial future. They are the first club in Italy to have followed that path um, where all the other stadia in Italy are owned either by the local municipality or the region um, or, or the federal government as it may be, but I think they're all municipality owned. In Asia, that's exactly the same. It's very, very rare across Asia to find a club that actually owns its own stadium and its own infrastructure, which it can commercialize. Stadia are generally owned either by the local municipality, the city, or the, the national government, depending on how big the territory we're talking about is. Um, and from that perspective then, the ability to commercialize that stadium, to make money from it, build a, build a brand there and also control that stadium, you lose those types of commercial revenues and you have to basically deal with what you've got. And there are a number of times in the past where we've seen disciplinary cases opened by FIFA or the AFC against um, football federations and clubs within Asia, but particularly clubs, um, over security issues. Because under the regulations, security issues are the responsibility of the clubs. So the club must ensure the security is up to the relevant international standard. But the club has no say. The club has no control. The club has no power. This is a municipality issue. This is a national government or a local government issue. So this is another thing where clubs really find themselves limited in their commercialization. And the last thing in Asia, which I think differentiates Asia, particularly from the rest of the world, prize money. So the commercialization of Asian football is, is actually quite limited, despite all the money in and around the game. Uh, it was two years ago that Dazen uh, sponsored the J-League in Japan. And it actually, I'm a very clever economist, not me, because I don't know nothing about numbers, but did run the numbers and, and noticed that, well, the team that finishes bottom of the Japanese J-League is actually earning more than the team that wins the AFC Champions League if they won every game and got every promotional bonus. So that provides the question, well, what's the point of clubs participating in the AFC Champions League? Is it just for prestige? Are they looking for commercial benefits? Obviously, by winning or doing well, there's alternate commercial benefits on the side. But right now, the prize money and the levels that it's set at for the clubs in Asia means that Every single client that I spoke to this week when putting this together said that they lost money when they had an Asian, an Asian club campaign, whether it was AFC Champions League or whether it was an AFC Cup campaign. 
And they said they lost money because that not only was just their general costs for getting involved in the competition, but also because if they were in the Champions League, of course, they have to hire players of a suitable standard and that costs money um, and it raises the, the wage bill, et cetera, et cetera. So that's another issue and challenge which we need to address in Asian football over the next decade. Governance, this goes back to that pyramid I gave you before, down here. So national football, although under FIFA statutes and the FIFA standardized statute system, a lot, of clubs are, a lot of clubs are considered members of the Football Association and have the right to vote at the General Assembly, or have the right, or General Assembly or um, Congress, whatever it might be called in your country, general meeting. In fact, and actually clubs have across Asia very limited scope or say in the, in the way that national football is run. Generally, clubs are an afterthought when it comes to organising football and football is organised from the top down and clubs are simply or merely informed this is what's going to happen. Very different to the European experience over the last 10 years when the ECA came in, um, clubs are directly involved not only in uh, league structures in European countries but also at, at UEFA level. Um, and you also have a very strong, of course, FIFA Pro Europe, which works on the other side of the ledger uh, with FIFA, uh, with UEFA in that respect. The second thing is club governance structures. So we go back to the picture here. Like I said, 47 different uh, football associations there. And the way football is structured in every country, of, of course, is different. But the way clubs are structured, of course, in every country is different. So here in, in Australia, the clubs are all private commercial entities. Um, so they have to report to the financial regulator. Sorry, I'm pointing, but not. You go through Malaysia and Singapore, the clubs are generally either associations or they are actually part of the state FA. So in Malaysia, there's 14 different states, for example, um, and the state, each state has a football association that might enter a club into, uh, into the, the top tier competition. So it'd be like um, uh, the Madrid municipality um, and the Madrid Football Federation entering a club into... Uh, the Spanish league, but then uh, the, Premier, the La Liga there is 90% of these types of clubs. You go through other countries, you move through the regions here. In Japan, obviously, the vast majority of clubs and Korea started with strong commercial support from one of the big, uh, one of the big uh, domestic uh, industrial suppliers. Samsung is still in the name of at least three clubs in the Korean K-League top division. Mitsubishi. Uh, Mitsubishi or Toyota? I get this wrong, so don't quote me. A disclaimer, legal disclaimer. Um, one of those two actually held a percentage in almost every single J League club when it started. Um, uh, when the J League started, so it could give those uh, give those clubs that boost that they required. You move across again. You've got now in India, you've got a, a strong debate between uh, an existing association club model versus a franchise style model coming through with the Indian Super League. Then you go through into West Asia, and particularly in um, particularly in the Gulf, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Qatar, etc., the clubs are not actually clubs in the sense that we talk about clubs in the European context or the Western context. The clubs are actually created by royal decree as sporting societies, and their funding and their governance structures are actually part of the national government structure. So technically, the clubs are not separate from each other at all. They're all part of the same, the same model. So in that respect, you can see Club structures, governance-wise, across the continent are completely different, and that provides big challenges when it comes to having the ability to influence the outcomes at national level or, or international level. A big example I like to give is in 2018, at continental level, the AFC changed its foreign player rules. The AFC was the last of the, uh, or it still remains, it's the only confederation which has a foreign player rule. So in, in Europe, you obviously have the homegrown player rule, but in AFC, it's got the three plus one rule. The way that was interpreted by AFC was changed. That was changed at a competitions committee meeting two months before the start of the AFC season. Does anyone here think clubs were consulted when that change was made? Or clubs were asked about their thoughts when that was made? Two months before the start of the season, you've got contracts in place, clubs that have already, um, clubs that have already uh, prepared for their season, and all of a sudden, they're being told the rules change. The same thing happened six months later in China, when the Chinese Football Association you introduced new rules with respect to under-23s being required to participate in the Chinese Super League. And Andres Villas-Boas very famously, um, if you look it up on YouTube, had a nice little, uh, 
uh, you have to censor a lot of the words, but a nice little uh, um, display against the Chinese Football Association for this. Because again, clubs that have been preparing for months in their pre-season, building their squads, foreign players, structuring their payments, etc., weren't consulted. And this is an issue in the governance of Asian football when it comes to um, clubs actually having a say. Club licensing, so for those that understand club licensing, in Asia, particularly with the way everything is structured, just like I've told you, I heard from a number of clients in Southeast Asia, West Asia and South Asia about this issue, is that the one-size-fits-all model doesn't take into account the national structure of football in their country and the way things are done. So you go back to the West Asia example I just gave you, all of those entities that are clubs are actually part of the national government or part of the royal family's uh, decree which goes through the government structure. But they're required to provide a number of different independent financial statements under club licensing regulations. They're provided to, required to provide a number of different compliance protections, etc., which in that structure is just simply not possible. Um, similarly, when you go, uh, similarly, when you go out to East Asia and you have uh, requirements with respect to club ownership, now, like I gave the example before of when the J-League first started, some of that still exists in a number of countries where uh, a major corporation or one of its subsidiaries will own a very small percentage of a club or have a holding in a club to ensure that there is that financial capacity or stability there. Now, obviously, we all know um, from the Red Bull example in Europe two years ago um, how this looks and how this needs to be dealt with. But again, there hasn't been an Asian solution to what I call an Asian uh, uh, the way an Asian problem, the way Asia is structured. Last issue, operational challenges. Language I've already spoken about. And the other one which I hadn't actually considered, but which every club actually came back to me and said, was signing new players. Simple. The first thing they have to do is convince them that the level that they're dropping down to isn't going to kill their future value. That's the first thing. Second thing is, it's the relocation. So you have a, a foreign player that comes in from Europe or a foreign player that comes in from a wealthy country who is going to be uh, a star of your team because he's a foreign player and you have limited foreign players, having to adjust to new culture, but not just that player. Relocating family, children, schools, etc., etc. All those types of considerations that people take, take to heart when they're looking to move to a different country. These are things you would think clubs wouldn't have to worry about, but they are absolutely at the forefront of play negotiations when you're moving to these countries. Visa issues. Of course, this is uh, something when you get to the geopolitics, provides a, last, uh, provides a lasting issue. And of course, the final one is currency. So international football, just to, I'm sure you all know, but the US dollar makes international football essentially go round. US dollar in English is the currency and language of choice when it comes to contracting, when it comes to advising. But occasionally you get issues, European player might want euros or players coming from a different country, or this particular country can only pay you in a certain currency based on, um, based on national rules or national laws, or you get to those countries which I spoke about before which are sanctioned. One of the big examples at the moment, of course, and has been for the last decade, is Iran. So Iran is a big football country, Perspolis, Estaglal, two of the most famous clubs in Asia. Tehran Derby regularly pulls 100,000 people to the Azidi Stadium, but it's impossible to transfer money out of the country. Despite the sanctions being lifted by the Obama regime, the banks still didn't latch on. The banks don't want to take up um, the banks don't want to take up the risk involved of transfers to and from Iran. And now, particularly with the Trump crackdowns over the last two years, the Iranian football clubs have still managed to sign big players, sign big coaches. Andreas Ramachioni is now the coach of uh, Estaglal uh, in in Tehran. Yet they still have that that currency issue. So all these types of things which you would never probably think about coming from. Uh, a European background, but these are some of the major issues and challenges which we see in Asian club football over probably the last five or six years, compiled from some of our clients across the globe. So that's, uh, that's us for now. Very quickly, you can stay in touch. I'll go back to the top. Uh, if there's any questions, we have a microphone. Otherwise, I'm happy to uh, meet one-on-one -on -one afterwards. Are there any questions at all? No is a good answer. So. Great. All right. No questions then. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for taking the time and uh, avoiding Atletico de Madrid. And uh, if you have any questions, come down and ask. I'm happy to ask them, answer them. Thank you.